country. Uh, we're blessed. I mean, we're just, we're just been fortunate to be born and raised here. You know, you could have been born anywhere else, but you were lucky enough to be born in this country. So it's not right to ever look down on someone born from another country and treat them differently. That's discriminatory. And God just chose you to be born here in the land of opportunity so you can be a blessing to people around the world, not to ever snub your nose. So I just want to make sure that we understand. Amen? And that's why, you know, it's, I'm not here to put down, I didn't put down Haiti. I mean, Colbert told us how bad it was after we had a long talk with him. Um, but um, a heart goes out, cause, but we need to help. We need to help. Amen? You help as many, you can't help the world, but you can help somebody. And if it's, if God, I believe God hooked us up with this gentleman and people there, uh, it was a divine appointment, and uh, we'll do what we can to help. And for those of you who never been out of this country before and don't know what it's like to live somewhere else, come to Guatemala with me. July 11th through the 15th. Yes, come out and um, we'll do some nice missions work. Amen? All right, got your Bibles? Yeah, let me see your Bibles. Hold them up way high like you just don't care. Wave them in the air like you just don't care. Remember those disco days? Yes, I was a roller rink disco guy in the 70s. Yes, that was me. Say this. <laughs> With my capizios. Say, this is my Bible. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Today I will receive the incorruptible, ever-living, never-changing, Holy Ghost power, Word of God, and I'll be changed in Jesus' name. Shout amen. 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 All right. Uh, open your Bibles. I'm going to start a series for the next couple weeks. I'm not going to spend long. I know it's, it's getting kind of late, uh, but open to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I want to share my series. I'm going to kind of go back to the basics a little bit for this year to start off again, but my purpose is to challenge you. So I'm going to, not, I'm going to build you up to a point where you can step out and be all that God has called you to be. Um, but I want to start from the very basics. And uh, one of the things I le learned a very long time ago is that there are four things that every single Christian needs to know right off the bat. The moment you become a Christian, the moment you give your life to Jesus, there's four things you have to know. If you don't know these things, you're wasting your time. Number one is you need to know who your father is. You need to know who God your father is. He's not just God, he's your father. Good? Number one. Number two, you need to know who your enemy is. There is an enemy out there. There's an adversary, the Bible says. All right, you need to know that you have an enemy. And he's out to eat your lunch, to challenge your faith, to come against you, to cause you problems, you know, just to mess up your life. Number two, I know there's, I heard a couple years ago, some churches don't even believe the devil exists. Like, if you don't believe the devil exists, you can't believe God exists. You know, those two, I mean, it's not that it's not the yin and yang, but uh, there's a reason why we go through challenges in life and how we have the problem and we have the sin nature in us is because of the devil. Number two, so you need to know who your father is, basic. You need to know who your enemy is, number two. Number three, you need to know who you are in relationship to your father. That you're a son and daughter of the Most High God. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You need to get rid of that saying because it's wrong. Once you get saved, you're a son and daughter of God. The Bible says that. John chapter 1. This has given us the power. Those who have received Christ, he's given them the power to become sons and daughters of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, Romans chapter 8, are the sons and daughters of God. Good? Okay, that's number three. Number four is you got to know who the Holy Ghost is. you got to know because now at this point, we have to be led by the Spirit of God. Good? So, those are the four basic things of every Christian. Jesus said, I've come to show you the Father. That's what he said. My whole purpose in life is to show you who the Father is. 
And he did come to destroy the works of the devil and everything he said that. But he said, I've come to show you who the Father is. Now, to being a Christian, there are three stages to knowing who your Father is. Or there's three stages of growth. So today I want to talk about the three stages of a Christian's growth. Okay? So if you just check for you there? Everybody there? Let me hear you say, I'm there. All right. Guess what? I'm not there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ready? It says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It says that we no longer should be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning uh, craftiness of deceitful plotting. So notice in those two verses he says this. He says that we should all become perfect. The word perfect there is the word mature. It doesn't mean to be perfect because there's nobody perfect except for Jesus. But he's saying that you should become mature. What does mature mean? It means you act like an adult, right? You act, you have some type of integrity, you have uh, a virtue, you have, you're a good character, great personality, so to speak. You're not a child, and notice it says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. So he says, he says this, Paul says, you all need to grow up. So the title of my message is, Grow Up. <laughs> Say, I'm growing up. Now, 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 how many of you know people that are like, you know, 50 years old, but they haven't grown up yet? Right? Listen, stop pointing at each other. You can grow up. You don't have a choice to grow physically, but you can grow emotionally, right? There's some people that just don't grow up emotionally, correct? Well, the same thing goes for Christians. The Bible says we need to grow up spiritually, there's a lot of Christians. I've been a Christian for since, uh, let's see, 1986, so almost 30 years. And so imagine that I'm still acting like a baby Christian. No, that shouldn't be. You should be a mature Christian by now. And so we have to learn how, what it is to, to be a Christian. So I'm going to go through the stages. Uh, people shouldn't be in the babyhood stage anymore. I'm going to try and get you. I'm not going to point fingers, but I'm hoping that by the end of the sermon, you can pinpoint where you're at so you know how much you need to grow. Good? That's it. Just fi find out where you're at. If, if, you go, if you have any of these characteristics in you, then you may be that person. Then you may need to grow a little bit. Good? Don't be mad at me. Don't be send me emails. Send them to him. I will make sure that I watch my mouth. I won't say any four-letter words. He didn't say any four-letter words. No. Okay, so... Physical growth comes in three stages. Number one is babyhood, number two is childhood, and number three is adulthood, right? So, what is babyhood? First Peter chapter 2. Let me give you characteristics of babyhood in terms of a physical person and a, and a Christian, a spiritual person, so to speak. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. First Peter 2, verse 2 says this. It says, as newborn babes... Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So notice Peter even says, listen, when you become a Christian, you need to grow. But every single baby, don't you, it, when babies are born, they can't eat food, right? They can't eat meat. They have to drink what? Milk. And so a baby Christian also has to be able to drink spiritual milk. What is spiritual milk? Well, you can't throw big stuff at them. you got to... Spoon feed them, little by little by little. Now, how do you know you're a baby Christian? Well, think about a baby. Where's the, is, he, is Inez here? Inez got her baby. I, I hate to say his name because it's the quarterback of the Patriots. She named him after the quarterback of the Patriots. But little Inez, or little Stephen Jr., his name is Brady. All right, I said it. Little Brady, uh, as a baby, what happens with a baby? One of the things babies do the most is what? Cry, right? Babies cry. Why do they cry? Well, a couple, number of reasons why. Number one is they got a dirty diaper, right? 
That's number one. And the funniest thing is how moms know they or check for the dirty diaper. They either stick their nose in there or they stick their finger in there, right? You ever see moms do that? No? I have. Janice never did that. But they stick their finger way down and say, yep, he did it. So, so babies cry because they have a dirty diaper. Other reason why they cry is they're hungry, right? Wah, I'm hungry. Another reason why they cry is they're tired, right? Or another reason why they're sleepy. Another reason why they cry is they just want to be held. So think about Christians that way. Christians are always whining, always complaining, always crying, or people in general. They're always complaining. They need to grow up. Amen. Leah, why are you smiling so much? So think about people or think about yourself. You're always, I mean, if something goes wrong, do you start crying about it? You know, oh, you know, uh, it's going to rain tomorrow. Uh, why can't it just be nice out? Why can't I live in Florida where it's always so nice? Or why can't Stu Leonard's have steak on sale again? Uh, you're always whining about stuff and crying about things. You may be a little immature. You may need to grow up a little bit. Second Corinthians 5.17, you know the scripture well. It says what? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Ready? It says, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. One of the number one traits of a brand new, spanking new Christian is this, is you no longer have a past. Brady, until the day he was born, he never existed. Brady did not have a past, right? So he never sinned. Brand new Christians, their old nature, their old sin nature, whoever they were, is passed away, the Bible says. God has washed it away by his blood. And so you have no past. You have no sin. So when people start telling you, well, oh, isn't that who you... No, that's not me anymore. In other words, this, the devil loves to throw your past in your face to make you feel guilty and condemned but all you got to do is say, listen, man, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm a new creature in Christ. My past is washed away. It's just like your ex that keeps calling you. Hey, baby. Yeah. Remember those times? Yeah. Or Facebook. Anyway, let's move on. Praise Jesus. The next thing that stands out about a baby is what? They'll put anything in their mouth. Think about Christians. They'll listen to anything. They'll turn on a TV. They'll watch Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar. They'll watch, you know, the guy from Mars. And they'll just suck everything in. Just like a baby. They'll stick their finger in their mouth. They'll stick your finger in their mouth. They'll suck on a pacifier. They'll, they don't know any better. As a Christian, you need to know better. In other words, not everything is true that people tell you, especially when it comes to the gospel. That Peter warned us of false teachers out there, false preachers. Remember the wacko from Waco? David Koresh? You have Sung Young Moon? You have all these nut jobs out there. The guy who said, drink the Kool-Aid. Jim Jones? There's a lot of nut jobs out there. It's all about the Bible. If the Word doesn't say it, don't believe it. Amen? And so in order for you to grow, don't be gullible. Don't listen to everybody out there. Praise Jesus. Now, I go, I hang out with the same kind of people that believe what I believe. And the reason why is because I want to feed off of them. I don't want, you know, I'm open. I'll, you know, I'll listen to something but I'm not going to jump around from camp to camp to camp to camp to camp and just to suck every, from everybody's doctrine because that's unscriptural. I feed off of the people, the word, that, that, that believe in the same thing I believe in. Praise Jesus. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I believe that. So, uh, so that's number one. Number two, childhood stage. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.14, it says that we should no longer be children. What stands out? Now, when I say child, I say, you know, five, six years old, once they get out of the babyhood stage, 
they can walk, they can talk, they go to school, and I will throw it up to the teen years. So what stands out about somebody who is a child? Number one thing is they always ask why. Why, Mom? Why, Dad? Why can't I do this? Why can't I go there? Why can't I eat this? Why do I have to go to sleep at 8 o'clock? Why do I have to go to school tomorrow morning? Why do I have to listen to you? Why does my teacher make me do this? Why this? Why that? Right? First of all, they question everything because they think they know everything. As a Christian, I know, even though I've, I've been a pastor for 20, almost 21 years, been a Christian for 30 years, there's still things that I don't know. And, the, and, and the, the day that you stop learning and growing is the day that you stop you start being more prideful and less humble. We always stay humble, no matter what. You don't think you know it all. Because there's only one that knows it all. And that's Jesus. Amen? So that's the childhood stage. They ask why. They think they know everything. They're full of excuses. The dog ate my homework. Or, you know, they cut school. They sign your name. Where's Ariane? Oh. They cut school and they sign your name to a pass. They're full of excuses. They do things that you don't know about. That's a kid. Now, what else do kids do? Young kids like that, they love to talk. Yak, 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 yak. Talk on the phone, they run up your cell phone bill and all that. Anyway, so the next thing is for an adult. The next thing is adulthood. And Romans chapter 8, verse 4. Let's go there. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. <clears throat> it says this, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So then those who are of the flesh cannot please God, but those who are of the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in them. So the number one way you know that you're a spiritual adult is by being led by the Spirit of God. You are no longer led by your flesh, but you're led by your spirit. Anybody know people who are completely led by their emotions? Right? They're a spiritual wreck. They're a spirit, emotional roller coaster. One day they're up, one day they're down. One day they're Dr. Jekyll, the other day they're Mr. Hyde. And you don't know who you're going to get on what certain day. Unless the stars are aligned, you may get you know, Mr. Hyde, or you'll get Dr. Je oh, what is it, vice versa? Who's the no, who's who's crazy one? Mr. Hyde. You may get Mr. Hyde instead of Dr. Jekyll. You cannot live on emotion. Emotion, I've said, I've preached a sermon on emotions. Emotions are the spice of life. In other words, they spice you up, but you don't live by spice. How many of you just, you get up in the morning, you just eat like a pound of salt? You don't. Salt makes things taste better, right? You put a little salt on your porterhouse steak, you cook it medium, you know, medium, nice, you char the top, inside is cooked perfectly, and you add a little salt for taste. Amen. But you just don't eat the salt, you can't throw salt on the grill. But people love to live by emotion. I like hot stuff. I throw cayenne pepper, I'll throw some hot hot ghost pepper sauce on stuff. Why? It makes it a little better. It makes your food spicy. But you don't live on spice. You got to have food. And so there's a lot of people that live on spice. They're all emotion. Thank you for your amen. Don't, you can be spicy. I like spicy people. Spicy makes you different. Doesn't, doesn't spice make the food taste better or different? Greeks, we cook with a lot of garlic and oregano. So you can tell that it's Greek food, basically, Middle Eastern, so to speak. If you're Indian, what's your favorite spice? See, so you know, right? If you're Puerto Rican, what's your favorite spice? 
Huh? Come on, Carlos. Tell us. Adobo. <laughs> Every culture has their own spice. But what it does, it makes the food taste a little different. So emotion is supposed to make you a little different than the other next person next to you. Okay, It adds a little bit. We're all human. We're all the same. But all of us got a little different spice going on. Amen. Praise Jesus. So, let me, uh, let's see. Let me... Uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 24. Um, I'm getting close to being done. I know you got to go. 11, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 24. What does it mean to be an adult in terms of a Christian? Um, uh, when you need advice, who do you go to? You go to somebody who's pretty stable, right? Somebody who has a proven track record. If you need an advice on finance, you go to somebody who's got some money. Right? You're not going to go to some, somebody who's in debt for advice on finance. Right? You're not going to go to a divorced person and ask them to help you with your marriage. No. So you go to somebody who's got a proven track record, who's stable, who's shown credibility and integrity in a certain area. Correct? And so to be an adult, it means that you're pretty stable and the things, as a Christian, and the things of this world don't pull on you as they did before. In other words, you don't have to get on Facebook 24 hours and ch update your status every five minutes. You can step away from Facebook because you're an adult. I don't, hey, I don't need that in my life. It doesn't run my life. Correct? And so look at what Moses did in verse 24. He says this. He says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God and to enjoy and refuse to enjoy the passing pleasures, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked for the reward. So what did he do? Listen, Moses had everything. He had honor. He had respect. He was next in line to the throne. He was the Pharaoh's daughter. He was schooled in the best schools but he turned it all away, and he said, I'd rather have God than have all the riches of the world. In other words, he says, those things don't pull on me anymore, but God has a greater pull on me than the riches of this world. So as an adult Christian, in order for you to grow up, you need to get to a point where the things of the world don't pull on you as much as God does. In other words, when God starts tapping on your shoulder and say, hey, can you, can you pray five minutes for Angelita or for Bill? Can you pray five minutes for the kids in Haiti? You say, yes, God, I can step away from Facebook and I can pray for five minutes for the kids in Haiti. Why? Because God's got a greater pull on you than the world does. To grow up as a Christian means you're going to be pulled, you're going to be pulled in two different directions. You're going to have a fight on your hands. One where, you know, the things of the world that you used to do, you used to love, but then you got God on the other side saying, come on, you can do this. I need you. This is why I called you. I guarantee you, you'll be blessed if you do this. Listen, if you're a dad and mom this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you this. If you're a dad and mom, you better start serving God to a point because your kids may be at stake. You set the example for your kids. And the Bible says that your righteousness will go down to three or four or thousand generations. See, a lot of people, you're here this morning, right? You're spending a wonderful hour and 45 minutes with me. Thank you. I want you to think about it this way. You may leave today and say, well, you know, I got a little bit out of it. Well, it was all right, or whatever. What you're doing today may not be for today. It may not be for you to feel good today. But 20 years from now, when your kids are growing up, I can guarantee you one day they're going to say, remember mom and dad used to take us to church? Remember mom and dad used to pray for us? That's when it's all worth it. You may not have faith, you may not need this faith for today, but I guarantee you, you're going to need it for the future. 
I've told you the story about Nicolette. We prayed for her. We wanted a daughter. And, and they said her genes were all messed up. Her chromosomes were all, these were down here. The 28 and 27 were one at 1 and 2. And they said, you need to abort her. And so we, we stood in faith, Janice and I. The first thing we asked when they did all the tests, they said, is it a boy or a girl? Not like we were going to give up on a boy, but we were praying for a girl. And they said, it's a girl. And it, it just rose up in me a fight. I said, I told I said, devil, there ain't no way you're taking my kid. And I told the, the doctor right to her face, Janice and I were standing right there, right as she's on a table, they're examining her. I said, you will deliver the healthiest baby you've ever delivered in your practice. I was bolder than bold can be, right to her face. She laughed at me, said, you need counseling. Now, you all know she's perfect, right? She says she's perfect. But, listen, here's where it comes down. The doctor told us that we'll be lucky if she lived to 16 years old. She'd be dead by she was 16. She'll be 20 in two weeks. She'll be 20 in two weeks. But the best part of it is, when she was five years old, I don't know if you remember, she was five years old, she wrote me and Janice a card. And she said, thank you for praying for me when I was in mommy's belly. This, here's my point. What you're doing today may not be for today, but 19 years later, our faith has paid off. Our fight paid off. We didn't sit and cry about it. Oh no, our baby's going to be retarded or mentally challenged or disabled or missing fingers. They told her she was going to be missing fingers. She'll have four fingers. They gave us a horror story, right? I mean, she was going to be totally deformed. They said you have to equip your house. You have to buy special equipment. You're going to have to care for her. And she goes, and usually husband and wives don't last. She went on and on and on. They gave us all the death sentence. Then they said she had cancer, cervical cancer. And they said, you have to abort her now. They kept pushing for us to kill her. But here's my point. Our faith has proven. Your faith may be challenged and tested, but 20 years from now, you're going to jump for joy when you see the fruit of your faith. So don't give up. But you have to grow up. This year I'm going to challenge every one of you to grow a little bit spiritually. I'm going to push you to places you've never been before. I'm going to ask you just to step out on some things. I'm not going to ask you to shave your head and sell flowers on the street corner. But I'm just, going to, I'm just going to gently nudge you to grow. Because we need to. Because our families could be at stake and our, their future could be at stake. Amen? I'm going to end there. i got another eight pages of notes, but I'm going to end there. So we're going to receive communion. <laughs>